Great, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, I'm Rachel Blyman. I'm here today presenting Looks and Dogs Can Be Deceiving, a study of student-on-student -student manipulation, which is about a social engineering case study that I designed and implemented in the summer of 2019. I'll be giving a summary of this project, but if you're interested in learning more about it, you can use the reference at the bottom of the screen or feel free to contact me. Um, and thanks for choosing to attend this talk today. So a little about me. My name is Rachel Blyman. Um, all my contact info is here. If you want to reach out to me about anything, you can hit me up on my through my email, Twitter, or at my website. Um, I just finished my undergrad in criminal justice in May from Temple University, which is in Philadelphia, PA. I also had minors in psychology and IST, which is information science and technology. Uh, I'm now a first year PhD student, still at Temple University in the criminal justice department. And I plan to focus my research on cyber crimes and online privacy and security concerns, including video surveillance. Uh, so for a little over the past year or so, I've been a research assistant to Dr. Anshul Rege in the CJ department. Um, who works a lot with the human factors in cybersecurity. She'll actually be presenting today too. Um, she helped guide me through this project that I'll be presenting about today. And she actually lent me her dog for this project also, which you'll see, soon see some pictures of. Um, so a few other acknowledgements before starting. I'd like to thank Temple University's Honors Program for funding this research project that I did and Temple University's Ethics Board for helping to make this research possible. So on the agenda for today, I'm first going to talk a bit about social engineering and specifically pretexting, including how it relates to psychological principles of persuasion and specific personality traits. I'll then explain the case study, which is the main focus for this presentation. I'll be detailing some of the strategies I used along with some of the findings. And of course, some dog pictures will be included. And I'll try and leave some time at the end for any questions you might have. OK, so social engineering, what is it? For any of those unfamiliar with it, social engineering can be described as any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interests. In 2017, roughly 70% of organizations in the US experienced social engineering attacks which accumulated in a cost of $2.76 million and an average of 20 days per incident to resolve. So these high monetary and manpower costs point to the fact that the human factor is often considered the weakest link in cyber attacks, which is why it's so important to study it. So while there are many stages and processes that an attacker goes through to reach their ultimate goal of their attack, Social engineering primarily takes place in the first reconnaissance or recon stage, which refers to the process of gathering information about a target. So in reference to this recon stage, it's been said that 50 to 75% of the legwork is to learn about that environment beforehand, whether it be through social engineering or calling these people and trying to understand what systems operate in their plan. Uh, there are many different forms of social engineering. I'll just go through a few of them here. Um, first up is baiting, which refers to when a hacker leaves accessible bait, such as a malware-infected USB stick, for targets to pick up and connect to their own computer, therefore installing the malware. Phishing refers to the ways in which an attacker can trick a target into providing personal information, usually through email, often by posing as a legitimate or trustworthy entity. Um, next is spear phishing, which is a form of phishing that occurs when an attacker chooses a target within a specific organization, then sends seemingly relevant or important emails with malicious links. Next is email hacking and contact spamming, which occurs when an email is hacked and contacts are spammed with malicious emails coming from that account. Next is vishing or voiced phishing, which, which refers to the phishing that occurs over the phone where a cyber criminal posing as a trusted individual, such as a bank, calls a target requesting personal info. Um, an attacker using quid pro quo typically offers targets something enticing, such as a prize or a discount in exchange for personal information. 
And last up is pretexting, which is a much more general term that refers to the practice of presenting oneself as someone else in order to obtain information. And the case study that I'll be describing in this presentation will be centered around this process of pretexting. So as I said, the specific type of social engineering that this case study focuses on is pretexting, where someone presents themselves as someone else in order to obtain private info. Attackers will impersonate individuals, sometimes those in highly specific and specialized jobs, such as someone in tech support, are typically unfamiliar to the general public. And the goal of pretexting is to create a situation where individuals feel safe or comfortable releasing personal information that makes them vulnerable to cyber attacks. A key point about pretexting is that a more thorough pretext will result in obtaining higher quality information from the target. So the more believable you are and the more trusting you appear, uh, the more info you'll get. So that leads us to some more general principles of pretexting that will make you seem more believable and trustworthy and therefore result in you having some more success. So first off, uh, the more research you do about your target and about your pretext, the better. When creating your pretext, try to involve some of your own personal interests so that your story is easier to remember and seems more sincere. Next, you'd wanna practice dialects or expressions because remember you wanna fit the role of the pretext that you're assuming. Using phones can also be helpful to reduce the effort Instead of doing it in person, where you have to worry about body language and clothing, uh, this is also helpful during COVID times when it's kind of hard to do anything in person. So over the phone would work. Next is that the simpler the pretext, the better. You don't want to include a million details that you might mix up or that might confuse the target. Pretext should also appear spontaneous, not like you've been sitting and wait for someone to fall for the trap or for it to seem too staged. Lastly, a good technique is to provide a logical conclusion. So tell the target something like, if you wanna know more, reach out at this number or this email. So you're basically setting up the next step of the pretext, making it continue and gaining more trust before starting on to the next part of it. Okay, then there are also some uh, personality traits that make people easier targets for a social engineering or pretexting attack, including conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So conscientious people tend to follow the rules, making them more vulnerable to a social engineering attack that exploits rules and social norms. Extroverted people tend to desire more social contact and are more likely than introverts to unknowingly cooperate with someone during a social engineering attack. Next, um, agreeable or trusting individuals are more likely to um, fall victim to a social engineering attack that relies on the attacker establishing trust with the victim. And lastly, neurotic individuals actually tend to be more cautious in their social interactions and therefore may actually be less likely to fall victim to a social engineering attack. Okay, so next are some uh, principles of persuasion that attackers can target in the execution of a social engineering attack in a way to manipulate their victims. So first up is authority, which preys on the fact that people tend to comply with the instructions of authority figures, such as bosses at work or government agencies, even if these instructions go against their personal beliefs, um, they're still going to comply because the instructions are coming from authority figures. Next is the principle of commitment in which people believe in the things they're committed to. Attackers can use that belief then to manipulate them. Similarly, consistency is the principle that people's behaviors and actions are based on their beliefs, which attackers can then exploit. The persuasion principle of reciprocity is the fact that people tend to return favors that are given to them, sometimes in even greater ways. Next is likeness or commonality, which is the principle that people are more likely to comply with someone if they share some sort of similarity with them, such as being from the same city, having the same name, or being the same age. The principle of scarcity suggests that people seek opportunities or items that are less available to them. Attackers can manipulate this persuasion principle 
by pretending to offer something scarce to make it seem more valuable and desirable. Next up is social proof, in which people tend to comply with a request when they know that other people have already done the same. And the last principle of persuasion is the natural inclination to help, in which people tend to want to help those in need. Attackers can exploit this by posing as someone who needs some form of assistance. So in the upcoming case study, you'll soon see the implementation of the persuasion principles of reciprocity and the natural inclination to help in a simulated social engineering attack. Okay, so now on to the case study. So the objective of my pretexting project was to see if college students were susceptible to disclosing sensitive information, and if so, how much and of what nature. To do this, I decided that I would try to social engineer people through pretexting. I created a short survey that asked for basic contact information as well as 10 commonly used security questions. I walked around my college campus with this survey and a clipboard, I approached people and I asked them to fill it out using one of four different pretexts as the reasoning for doing the survey. Uh, because this was a student research project, I completed ethics training for working with human subjects. And after each uh, student completed the survey, I disclosed to them the true nature of the project and I interviewed them on their participation from which I gathered some of my findings. I also returned the surveys to each student afterwards since they contained some highly sensitive information, but I did still record which questions they answered and which questions they skipped. So here's a picture of the survey that I social engineered students into filling out. As you can see up at the top, it's asking for some contact information. Uh, it has phone number, student ID, email address, um, then the 10 numbered questions are asked in an order of increasing sensitivity. So as so, I expected people to answer the first seven or so questions since they weren't extremely invasive. But I wasn't really expecting many people to answer the last three questions as they're very common security questions. Um, it was, what city did your parents meet? Uh, what's your mother's maiden name? And what street did you grow up on? Which I see over and over again as security questions. So these are the four pretexts that I created and used during this case study. Each week I used a different pretext and I assumed a character role in um, order to convince the people to fill out the survey. Two of the pretexts exploited the natural inclination to help and the other two pretexts exploited reciprocity, those persuasion principles I mentioned a few minutes ago. So in the pretext termed student helping student, I posed as a college student asking for help with a course project for a research methods class where I needed people to fill out my survey for a better grade in the class. I told them that it was more about creating surveys than actually the information on it. That's why it was just some general information. In the student helping niece pretext, I posed as a student who was helping her young niece with an extra credit school project. Um, then in the raffle pretext, I posed as a student employee promoting a new apartment building on campus that was looking to learn more about student demographics. I told students that if they fill out the survey, they would be entered into a raffle drawing for a gift card. And lastly, in the therapy dog pretext, I was advertising a fake therapy dog club on campus. And I said that in order to join, students just needed to fill out the survey. I actually brought a dog along with me, as I mentioned, which also served as an additional aspect of reciprocity because the students had the benefit of petting and playing with the dog if they filled out the survey. Um, so next to each pretext, you can see the number of people who took the survey each week. These numbers varied some due to environmental factors, um, but overall people were more inclined to participate when using the student helping student pretext or the therapy dog pretext. Um, and then before I started executing this project, I made some guesses on what would happen. I expected that the student's susceptibility to disclosing private information would change depending on the pretext. And specifically, I expected that the therapy dog pretext would see the most successful answer rates because I thought the dog would attract a large number of people and distract the targets from questioning the sincerity of the pretext. Um, 
I thought it would make me seem just more trusting overall to have a dog with me. I also expected that the raffle pretext would be the least successful of the four because I thought it was just the weakest and most elaborate explanation as to why I wanted this information from the targets. Uh, then a third ex um, expectation that I had was that I thought most of the targets would just decline taking the survey or only answer the less sensitive questions and definitely leave the more invasive ones blank. Uh, this is why I asked the questions in an order of increasing sensitivity so that I could kind of ease them into it and not just scare them away immediately by asking for their mother's maiden name. Then the last expectation I had was that uh, my gender as a female would play a role and that in all the pretexts, I would seem more trusting because I'm a girl. Okay, so here we can see some of the question response rates from the student helping student pretext. Um, the questions asking for the phone number and the student ID had the lowest response rates at 47% for the phone number and 53% for the student ID. Um, but all the other questions had at least a 76% 76 76 response rate, and that's including those invasive questions like the mother's maiden name. And some questions even had 100% um, response rate, some of the favorite um, questions asking for your favorite sports team, food, and number. So that was for the student helping student pretext. For the raffle pretext, um, we can see that the mother's maiden name had a 57% response rate, which was the only super low um, response rate for this pretext. Everything else had at least a 71% response rate. And again, some things even had a 100% response rate. For the student helping niece pretext, um, the questions asking for mother's maiden name, student ID, favorite book, and phone number all had the lowest response rates for this pretext. Um, mother's maiden name was a particularly low, which was at 45%, the others in the 55 or 64% range. But all the other questions for this one still had a 73% response rate, which is pretty high. Again, uh, four different of the questions had a 100% response rate. And lastly, we can see the response rate for the therapy dog pretext. Um, so the questions asking for a favorite book, favorite movie, mother's maiden name, and street name, the lowest response rates here, um, other than favorite book, the other three lowest ones still were at 69%, which is still kind of high. It's not that low. Um, and all the other questions had at least a 75% response rate. Um, in this one, everybody told me their birthday, which I thought was interesting. Okay, so now we can compare the four pretexts side by side. I split this up by the type of question. Um, so here we can see the response rates for the contact information and some of the general information questions. These were the ones that, um, well, some of these were more sensitive than others. Um, so we can see here that the therapy dog pretext had nearly the highest response rate for each question, although response rates for all the questions for each pretext were still relatively high. Um, the student ID and phone number did have the overall lowest response rate in this set this set of questions. This wasn't too surprising because of these questions, I think they are the most um, sensitive ones. For example, um, at least at my school, with your student ID number, you can access um, dining halls, you can um, use your ID number to pay for things, so it, it does have some money value to it. Next up are the questions that ask about different preferences and favorites. So these questions also weren't too invasive, so they generally had high response rates. The two pretexts that targeted the natural inclination to help seemed to have higher response rates than the ones targeting reciprocity for these questions. Also, um, I just want to point out that the question asking about the favorite book had one of the lowest response rates um, of all of the questions, which I learned from doing the post-disclosure interviews that it wasn't because your favorite book is a really sensitive you know, information, but it was simply because people don't read books anymore and could not name a single book, which I thought was kind of funny. 
Okay, so these three questions ask for the highly sensitive information of in what city their parents met, their mother's maiden name, and on what street they grew up on. So these questions had some of the lowest response rates from the survey, which what was expected. However, most response rates still ranged from about 60 to 80 percent, which is alarmingly high considering how sensitive these questions are. Um, and for each of these three questions, the highest response rates were received under the student helping student pretext. So despite the differences in the number of subjects surveyed and interviewed for each pretext, um, subjects answered approximately the same number of questions, regardless of which, of which pretext was used. Um, for each of them, the median number of questions answered was about 14. It was 13 for the student helping niece. Um, this suggests that the pretexts may have impacted how many people agreed to participate in the survey, but it didn't have a great impact on how much information subjects were willing to disclose. However, we did see some variation in which questions they chose to answer. Then if we look at the response rates as a whole, the lowest response rates were still in about the 60% range. So half of the targets still disclosed answers to even the most sensitive questions. And all of the questions um, had about a 70% response rate or higher. Um, so next we move on to some of the findings from the post-disclosure interviews. Um, so from these post-disclosure interviews where I asked targets why they trusted me and why they answered or skipped any questions, I was able to identify several themes. So first was that across all pretexts, subjects reported trusting me because of our shared attributes, including age, gender, or life experiences. Um, these similarities led targets to feel more sympathetic towards me. In the student helping student pretext, subjects reported feeling uh, inclined to help for reasons such as uh, having had similar experiences in their own lives. For example, one person said that they agreed to participate because it was for a class, and I know how hard it is to get people to actually take surveys for classes. So they related to me as a college student or had some experience trying to get people to to participate in surveys, which made them feel higher levels of trust and a greater inclination to help. Another subject even explained that if I know it's a, a fellow Temple student, I'm more likely to give them my time. Interestingly, in the raffle pretext, which if you recall, aimed to target reciprocity, targets actually told me that the pretext triggered for them a natural, inclina a natural inclination to help instead. Um, this unexpected response was a result of this likeness factor. In this raffle pretext, not a single student reported that they participated for the chance to win the raffle prize. Instead, each person reported that they initially agreed to take the survey, either out of sympathy towards me or because of their inclination to help me. The sympathetic responses came from students experiencing similar life events. So, for example, one person stated that, I've been on the other end and I always feel bad when people are rude and walk away. Another student reported that the chance to win money did not entirely impact their decision. Instead, they said, I just like helping out people because I see them get turned down all the time. And I know I want to be a researcher one day too. So I know one day I'm going to be turned down all the time. So that was more being nice than the money itself. Last point is that in the student helping niece pretext, when I asked why they were able to trust me and felt comfortable giving me their information, one person said that they felt more comfortable around me because we were both women. She said that she trusted me because you're a young woman, I'm a young woman. Definitely more comfortable than if a grown man came over and asked me. So overall, it was pretty clear that people felt more inclined to talk to me and trust me when they were able to relate, understand my experience, or have something in common with me. Great. So another theme that I identified was the importance of the college student role that I was using in my pretexts. So as I mentioned earlier, pretexting relies on making yourself credible and believable. Because people were able to believe that I was a college student based on what I said and how I looked, um, trusted me more and they had no reason to doubt me. 
I fit in the description of who I was pretending to be. I exploited my youth and I wore university clothing to blend into my role, as Targets pointed out in their interviews. Um, one person said that college shirt and younger looking made them believe that I was a college student. Um, another person said that I fit the demographic, the demographic because of the youth in my face. Um, in the raffle pretext, one person said that, I think if you were like super young or even super old, and you said you were with the university's marketing team, I wouldn't really believe you, just because I know it's geared more towards actual students. But because you actually look like you're within the range of a student here, I believed you. So it also helped that I was executing this on campus. Uh, one student said that, I feel like the fact that I'm on campus makes me a little more lenient to answering them. But definitely if I was on the sub and someone asked me, I definitely would not have answered them like at all. But I feel like it's kind of like a safe environment. And that's why I didn't think much of it. So out of all of the people I spoke to with this, with this pretext, there was only one student who questioned my role as a student. Um, but after the, the person asked to see my ID, they agreed to take the survey. Um, and this person said that they trusted me because I saw you with a temple shirt and you're in the middle of campus where if you were a scammer, you might be around people that might build attention or stop you. And then they said, once you showed me your ID card, I knew you were another Temple student. Let's say if you weren't, I probably would have said no. So having the student ID card to back up my pretext really helped in this case. And if I didn't have that, they may not, they probably would not have trusted me. Um, so overall here, a large portion of targets said that they were able to trust me simply because they were able to confidently assume that I was a student. So in the post-disclosure interviews, I also inquired about how aware the targets were about the sensitive nature of the question that I was asking them. So if we exclude the therapy dog pretext for a moment and just look at the first three pretexts, about 26 of the 34 targets that were interviewed reported that they realized while taking the survey that their answers could be used to access passwords or security questions. Many people said that they were not currently using any of those answers, so they didn't mind disclosing that information at that moment. Um, generally, students reported being more uncom most uncomfortable when answering the questions about their mother's maiden name, the street they grew up on, and the name of their favorite pet. So despite this, people still reportedly answered these with truthful responses, as we saw. Um, and while most of the subjects recognized that certain questions were highly sensitive, the majority of them still answered the questions because they felt they could trust me. For example, one person said, when I started putting down all my information, I was like, wait, I probably shouldn't put that down. But I was already halfway done with it. So I was like, whatever. Um, Another person said, I thought about it, but I just felt like maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. Uh, so in response to whether they use this information for their security questions or password, one person said, oh yeah, the mother's maiden name, the name of your, the name of your favorite pet, that too. Once I wrote it down, I immediately regretted writing it down. I was like, oh wow, that's one of the, that's one I kind of put for my passwords. Um, Similarly, another subject said that they disclosed the favorite food to me, which they often use for their passwords. Um, so in the student helping niece pretext, a student reported that I didn't look at everything first because you have the question structured. I'm like, yeah, that's what a second grader would ask. And towards the end, I'm like, what? So while some students did hesitate, their doubt wasn't strong enough to stop them from disclosing their information in order to help me even when they use it for their passwords or their security questions. So another question I asked in the post-disclosure interviews was about how people share their information online. So most of the subjects reported that they're more cautious online, uh, such as on social media pages, because they're always warned about the dangers of online scammers. Uh, most of the people I talked to said that they never thought that offline scammers were a threat as well. Uh, for example, one person described this project as a wake-up call to them. And another person said that they would be more cautious in the future when disclosing their information. So after taking the survey, all of the subjects who reported not already being wary of what they post online 
responded that they would be more mindful when disclosing information in the future. One student said, um, definitely what I give out to people. I think I need to be more careful maybe. So overall, this helped to shed some light on the threats of in-person scammers, not just online, which a lot of students were not aware of. So lastly, an interesting point that came up in the interviews was the presence of the dog. Here you can see me and Buster here. Um, he helped a lot with this pretext. So most of the people that I talked to automatically trusted me when they saw me walking around with Buster and they agreed to fill out the survey without really caring what my pretext was. Uh, people were just eager to pet the dog. So I would wait until the students were already playing with him and then I would ask them to return the favor by taking my survey. Of course, reciprocity was targeted here by being able to join the therapy dog club if they filled out the survey. But most people did not even know what they were signing. They just wanted to play with the dog and continue playing with him. Um, so this pretext differed from the others. Uh, in this pretext, people didn't say that they disclosed their information as a way to help me or because they related to me in a way that made them trust me. Rather, all of the subjects interviewed in this pretext said that they took the survey so that they could continue petting the dog. Um, 10 of the 15 subjects reported trusting me almost solely because of the dog. Most also said that they would have trusted me no matter my appearance, age, or gender, as long as I had a dog with me. Um, one subject explained that in general, they trust people more if the person has a dog with them. And one person even said that somebody who walks around with a dog probably isn't part of a phishing scam, which is a little ironic. Um, and then one of my favorite quotes from this entire case study was, dogs, man, I'll do anything for them. Um, lastly, another subject explained that it doesn't surprise me that this worked. It's something about the dog. Dogs are approachable. They're more approachable than people. And you offered for me to pet the dog, which is more enticing. So the lesson learned here is that if you want to try social engineering someone and gaining someone's trust, dogs seem to be a pretty good way to go. Okay, so finally some key takeaways. Um, so this study suggested that the type of pretext used in a social engineering attack might be fairly insignificant as long as the attacker meets one of two conditions that makes the pretext believable and gains the target's trust. The first condition is the adherence to the character role. Uh, the person creating and initializing the pretext needs to fit into the character role for the age, gender, race, or any other stereotype of the person they're aiming to impersonate. For example, uh, in this study, I fit into how an expected college student would appear, mainly based on my age and clothing choice. So if I had pretended instead to be a professor, uh, I would not have been as believable. The second condition is a likeness factor. There must be some similarities between the person implementing the pretext and the target, which creates an aura of ease and comfort. So some possible similarities include age, gender, or similar interests. So it's evident that a pretext can also target more than a single psychological principle of persuasion. So as seen in this study, um, with the raffle pretext, I was able to target reciprocity, but also the natural inclination to help, and inadvertently even likeness and commonality. So thanks so much for listening to this talk. Um, I have some time now at the end um, if you have any questions. And also feel free to contact me um, afterwards. I have my email, my Twitter, my website listed here. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I can see you're in Discord. How do you want to handle questions? Do, do you want to take a look at the channel or do you want me to be reading them off to you? Um, if you want to read them off to me, that would be that would be great. Brilliant. I'm just scanning through here to see. I see some comments about people liking the dog, people thinking that pretexting works or commenting that they've done work. I haven't seen any questions yet. By the way, if anybody does have any questions, just use the uh, Octothorpe Ask Rachel. Cool. 
Um, what about kittens? <laughs> Thank you, Spammy. You that is take an, kittens out on leashes. That's an excellent question. But actually, that is that is a great question. What prompted you to pick a dog as opposed to say a cat or a hamster or a bunny? Well, I think some of the other ones would be a little hard to walk around campus, but um, just being a student on campus, whenever somebody was walking around with a dog, strangers would always come up to them and want to talk to them. Um, and it was really just obvious that if you had a dog, it was just an immediate way to attract attention and get people to talk to you. Totally makes sense. And yeah. I, I, I love that quote that you have dogs, man, I'll do anything for them. Like, that, I feel like that so perfectly encapsulates most people's attitude. Mm -hmm. People were people were very excited when they saw me walking around. Um, it was great. And I'm not, um, a, I don't know that many dog. I don't know things about dogs that well. So um, when I, when I first got the dog from uh, Dr. Reggae, I, she told me just some of the basic facts about him, his breed, his name, how old he was. And I I don't know dogs at all. So I was trying sure. to remember my best to remember this dog breed name because everybody was asking me all these questions about him. And that came a little that became a little tricky with the pretext trying to remember that because it's not something that I'm super used to being around dogs or even just walking dogs. I was afraid I would seem like an imposter. <laughs> because I had never really walked dogs before. Totally, totally. Well, we got another question from Osprey. This is, uh, it's getting some plus ones even. Um, did you, in the post interview, ask about whether or not people answered honestly? In other words, they filled out answers, but they just filled out junk because they didn't want to give you an answer, but they didn't want to leave it blank. So I didn't ask that directly, but a few people um, told me that they wrote answers that were not currently true, like um, like something that used to be true for them, but not anymore. Um, but it wasn't something I had thought of beforehand to ask, but a few people did bring that up, which I thought was interesting. Um, I think it was maybe um, like half a dozen people or so oh, said okay. that they wrote some fake answers. Oh, well, interesting that they felt so wrapped with guilt they had to tell you, oh, it was fake answers. Anyway. <laughs> Um, have you done any research or investigation into checking out whether there are differences in responses between oral and written surveys as far as social engineering is concerned? I have not, but that's a very interesting idea. Um, something that I would, I would want to look into. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And I apologize. I've already lost who asked that question. Uh, Meow asked that question. Great question, Meow. Um, Yisos phobic, I think, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, sorry. Uh, do you think the principle of consistency kicked in through having the questions become gradually more sensitive? Do you think you would have gotten different results if the questions were randomized in terms of sensitivity? Interesting. Um, I could see how that may have kicked in, yes, with them starting off answering them honestly. Um, I do think if they weren't randomized um, and they started off seeing some uncomfortable questions that they wouldn't answer honestly for the rest of them. Um, so yeah, I think I think that makes sense um, to be consistent in their answers. Mm -hmm. That was a good point. So uh, another question. Uh, what do you think the likelihood is that students you targeted, oh yeah, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm reading halfway through, students you targeted actually gave real info. So it, just for everybody to, to hear, um, actually, do you wanna just repeat that? Because I've actually seen that question pop up in two different ways again, twice. So do you wanna just re-mention re your answer, uh, the, the likelihood that people gave you real answers in your questions? Sure, sure. So um, I didn't directly ask this to the people that I interviewed, but um, a few people did come out, about five or six people came out and said that they wrote answers that weren't currently true for them. Um, for instance, somebody wrote, instead of the um, address they grew up on, they wrote their grandmother's address instead. So there were a few people who said that they wrote some fake answers 
are not currently true answers, but for the most part, people said that um, people didn't mention it, which led me to believe that they were true, although who knows? Right, right, right. This actually, I, I, I found this just incredibly fascinating. This is a great talk. Uh, and it reminded me of in college when I would see those folks and if I felt like I would give an answer I would only give an answer if I was going to get something, and if I gave an answer, it was always lies. So I guess I'm just an outlier and super selfish. <laughs> right. I mean, this um, d just doing this project made me more aware of what I'm giving out. Like um, sometimes when you're on like a website and Google wants you to take a survey before you can t before you can continue, I'll um I'll just break fake answers for all of those now because I'm just oh, super paranoid. <laughs> Absolutely. Or what anecdotes you pass about yourself while giving a talk at a virtual conference. <laughs> um, let me see. Many databases. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it looks like I think we've gotten all the questions that I've seen posted up here, but I want to give everybody just a minute more. So let me ask one of my questions while I give everybody just a moment to send in some more. Where, where do you want to go next? What's the next step for your research with this? Right, so that's a good question. Um, so I am in the PhD program now, so I'm trying to focus my research ideas. I definitely um, still want to involve social engineering. Um, I'm also looking more into online privacy concerns. Um, so things like um, how you know certain websites might be using or getting your personal information um just being aware of how websites are taking your personal information um and that kind of thing sure yeah that that is great work and i mean as your research shows there's plenty of room to help educate folks so that they can understand the consequences of what they're doing mm -hmm. and it's really interesting because um i'm in the, the criminal justice program so i'm not doing anything um technical really, but it's still such a, a huge field for cybersecurity research still. Totally. I, I see another question has come in and I know your talk spoke around this a bit. The question is, as an older grad student, do you think the results would, or if you had looked as though you were an older grad student, do you think the results would have been the same? Do you, um, so actually I'll just pose that question to you first. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm very short. I'm kind of small. So I think even if I were older, I'd still look young. Um, but I think if I did just overall look older, people might not trust me as well if I claimed to be a student and I didn't look like a student. Um, it might be for the for the student helping student pretext where I said I was in a class. If I explained that I was a graduate student, they might believe me more. But I think overall. That might just be more intimidating and wouldn't be as, you know, I would not seem as trustworthy, I think, if I were too much older. Um, totally. But just a few, believe, a few years, though, I think would be fine. Sure. And I, I believe you even said that several participants gave you feedback that your appearance of looking young being female made them feel more comfortable, made them feel like they were interested in participating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. They could just tell right away that I was uh, a student. They probably thought I was a freshman because I'm really short. <laughs> uh, have you given thought to doing this again with just changing up who the person is? So changing just different variables about the the physical appearance of the questioner to see if that uh, to see what effect that has on people answering. I haven't considered that, but I was um, curious if I had done this online rather than in person, if I still yeah. would have, um, you know, if people still would have wanted to help me and if they still would have trusted me as much without being able to see me. Um, but I haven't, I, I haven't considered changing my appearance like that. Well, I, I love what you're thinking there. I, I think that the, I would be super interested to read your paper on if it changes in person versus online. I have my thoughts, but I'd love <laughs> to see that data. Yeah, maybe I'll, um, I'll look into that. Yeah, that would be really cool. Well, 
it looks like we've wrapped all the questions. There's a bunch of kudos in here saying that you, they enjoyed your talk and great job. And I absolutely want to